A Wishes for the Claws of Heaven by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Had I the heaven's embroidered claws and wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 8 And You As Well Must Die, Beloved Dust by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira Searle April 2015 And you as well must die, beloved dust, And all your beauty stand you in no stead. This flawless, vital hand, this perfect head, this body of flame and steel, Before the gust of death, Or under his autumnal frost, Shall be as any leaf, Be no less dead Than the first leaf that fell. This wonder fled, Altered, estranged, disintegrated, Lost. Nor shall my love avail you in your hour, in spite of all my love, you will arise upon that day and wander down the air, obscurely as the unattended flower, it mattering not how beautiful you were, or how beloved above all else that dies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. April by Elizabeth Clementine Kinney Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King Capricious April, beautiful coquette, Thou wearest now a smile, and now a frown, And now a pensive air, with lids cast down, And thy sad visage, with fresh teardrops wet, Then all at once, thou sadness dost forget, Thy forehead circling with joy's radiant crown, And laughing gaily with a laugh thine own, Lovely in smiles, in tears more lovely yet. Thy favourites are not princes of the earth, Nor gay gallants, but sons of lowly birth, For ploughman and for planter are thy wiles. Thy bird-toned voice calls rustics from the hearth to labour, while thy presence care beguiles, And quickens precious seed Beneath thy tears and smiles. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Ballad of an Anti-Puritan by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Tony Scheinman they spoke of progress spiring round, of light and Mrs. Humphrey Ward. It is not true to say I frowned or ran about the room and roared. I might have simply sat and snored. I rose politely in the club and said, I feel a little bored. Will someone take me to a pub? The new world's wisest did surround me, and it pains me to record I did not think their views profound or their conclusions well assured. The simple life I can't afford. Besides, I do not like the grub. I want a mash and sausage scored. Will someone take me to a pub? I know where men can still be found, anger and clamorous accord, and virtues growing from the ground, and fellowship of beer and board, and song that is a sturdy chord, and hope that is a hardy shrub, and goodness that is God's last word. 
Will someone take me to a pub? Envoi. Prince, Bayard would have smashed his sword to see the sort of knights you dub. Is that the last of them? Oh, Lord, will someone take me to a pub? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Because I Could Not Stop for Death by Emily Dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Lyra Morris Clark April 11, 2015 Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tulle. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day, I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dirge by Alfred Craneborg Read for LibriVox.org By Shakira Searle April 2015 Death alone has sympathy for weariness, Understanding of the ways of mathematics, Of the struggle against giving up what was given, The plus one minus one of nitrogen for oxygen, And the unequal odds, you, a cell against the universe, a breath or two against all time. Death alone takes what is left, without protest, criticism, or a demand for more than one can give, who can give no more than was given, doesn't even ask, but accepts it as it is, without examination, valuation, or comparison. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Elegy on the Death of a Mad Dog by Oliver Goldsmith. Read for LibriVox.org by Tony Scheinman. Good people all of every sort, give ear unto my song. And if you find it wondrous short, it cannot hold you long. In Islington there was a man, of whom the world might say, That still a godly race he ran, whene'er he went to pray. A kind and gentle heart he had, to comfort friends and foes. The naked every day he clad, when he put on his clothes. And in that town a dog was found, as many dogs there be, Both mongrel, puppy, whelp, and hound, and curs of low degree. This dog and man at first were friends, but when a peak began, the dog, to gain his private ends, went mad and bit the man. Around from all the neighboring streets the wondering neighbors ran, and swore the dog had lost his wits to bite so good a man. The wound it seemed both sore and sad to every Christian eye, and while they swore the dog was mad, they swore the man would die. But soon a wonder came to light that showed the rogues they lied. The man recovered of the bite. The dog it was that died. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fidessa, Sonnet 37 by Bartholomew Griffin Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf Fair is my love that feeds among the lilies, the lilies growing in that pleasant garden where Cupid's mount, that well-beloved hill is, and where that little god himself is warden. 
see where my love sits in the beds of spices beset all round with camphor myrrh and roses and interlaced with curious devices which her from all the world apart encloses there doth she tune her lute for her delight and with sweet music makes the ground to move whilst i poor i do sit in heavy plight wailing alone my unrespected love not daring rush into so rare a place that gives to her and she to it a grace end of poem this recording is in the public domain fitchburg by carolyn a mason read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson nestled among her hills she lies the city of our love within her pleasant homes arise and healthful airs and happy skies float peacefully above a sturdy few mid hopes and fears her fair foundations set and looking backward now through years of steady gain how small appears her old estate and yet she dons no autocratic airs in scorn of humbler days but shapes her fortunes and affairs to match the civic wreath she wears and justify her bays honor and truth her old renown conservative of both the virtues of the little town she holds in legacy to crown the city's larger growth nor ease nor sloth her strength despoil her peaceful farmers till with patient thrift the outlying soil her trained mechanics deftly toil her merchants ply their skill her ponderous engineries supply a thousand waiting needs her wheels revolve her shuttles fly and ever where the prize hangs high her foot unfaltering leads her sympathies are large and sweet and when at freedom's call the war flags waved the war drums beat she sprang responsive to her feet and freely offered all alert in war she emulates the arts of peace as well religion order guard her gates wealth culture thrift like happy fates her destinies foretell so through the round of years she keeps advancing on her past her old-time vigor never sleeps and even as she sows she reaps god bless her to the last end of poem this recording is in the public domain green grow the rushes by robert burns read for librivox by tony scheinman green grow the rushes o oh. green grow the rushes o oh. The sweetest hours that e'er I spend are spent among the lasses, O. Oh. There's naught but care on every hand, in every hour that passes, O. Oh. What signifies the life a man, and where na for the lasses, O? Oh. Green grow the rushes, O. Oh. Green grow the rushes, O. Oh. The sweetest hours that e'er I spend are spent among the lasses, O. Oh. The wily race may riches chase, and riches still may fly them o, and though at last they catch them fast, their hearts can ne'er enjoy them o. Green grow the rushes o, green grow the rushes o, the sweetest hours that e'er I spend are spent among the lasses o. But give me a canny hour at e'en, my arms about my dearie o. And wily cares and wily men may I gae tap saltirio. Green grow the rushes, o, oh. green grow the rushes, o. Oh. The sweetest hours that e'er I spend are spent among the lasses, o. Oh. For you, sad deuce, ye sneer at this, ye're not but senseless asses, o. Oh. The wisest man the while e'er saw, he dearly loved the lasses, o. Oh green grow the rushes o oh. green grow the rushes o oh. the sweetest hours that e'er i spend are spent among the lasses o oh. old nature swears the lovely dears her noblest work she classes o oh. her prentice hand she tried on man and then she made the lasses o oh. green grow the rushes o oh green grow the rushes o oh. the sweetest hours that e'er i spend are spent among the lasses o oh. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. High Tide by Jean Starr Untermeyer Read for LibriVox.org by Raymond Cockle I edged back against the night. The sea growled assault on the wave-bitten shore, and the breakers, like young and impatient hounds, sprang with rough joy on the shrinking sand. Sprang, but were drawn back slowly, with a long, relentless pull whimpering into the dark. Then I saw who held them captive, and I saw how they were bound with a broad and quivering leash of light, held by the moon, as calm and unsmiling she walked the deep fields of the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. House of Dreams by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Elise Boucher Milwaukee, Wisconsin You took my empty dreams and filled them, every one, With tenderness and nobleness, April and the sun. The old empty dreams where my thoughts would throng Are far too full of happiness to even hold a song. Oh, the empty dreams were dim, and the empty dreams were wide. They were sweet and shadowy houses where my thoughts could hide. But you took my dreams away, and you made them all come true. My thoughts have no place now to play, and nothing now to do. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I'm Nobody, Who Are You? by Emily Dickinson. Read for LibriVox.org by Lyra Morris Clark. April 11, 2015. I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Are you Nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog, to tell your name the live long June to an admiring bog. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Charge by Oliver Wendell Holmes Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Now, men of the North, will you join in the strife For country, for freedom, for honor, for life? The giant grows blind in his fury and spite one blow on his forehead will settle the fight flash full in his eyes the blue lightning of steel and stun him with cannon bolts peel upon peel mount troopers and follow your game to its lair as the hound tracks the wolf and the beagle the hare blow trumpets your summons till sluggards awake beat drums till the roofs of the faint-hearted shake yet yet ere the signet is stamped on the scroll their names may be traced on the blood-sprinkled roll trust not the false herald that painted your shield true honor to-day must be sought on the field her scutcheon shows white with a blazon of red the life drops of crimson for liberty shed the hour is at hand and the moment draws nigh the dark star of treason grows dim in the sky shine forth from the battle cloud light of the morn call back the bright hour when the nation was born the rivers of peace through our valleys shall run as the glaciers of tyranny melt in the sun smite smite the proud parricide down from his throne his sceptre once broken the world is our own end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Less than the dust by Lawrence Hope, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Less than the dust beneath thy chariot wheel, less than the rust that never stained thy sword, less than the trust thou hast in me, O Lord, even less than these, less than the weed that grows beside thy door, less than the speed of hours spent far from thee, less than the need thou hast in life of me, even less am I since i o lord am nothing unto thee see here thy sword i make it keen and bright love's last reward death comes to me to-night farewell zahiru din end of poem this recording is in the public domain the library by carolyn a mason Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson From the Ode Read at the Dedication of the Wallace Library and Art Building, Fitchburg Ah, what a treasury of wisdom lies in a good book! And who would not be wise? What founts of sweetness and strength well up from its deep heart? Who would not quaff the cup? The bees must know where honey-dews abound, Oh, for a human instinct as profound! The birds must fathom where the Southland lies. Oh, for an intuition half as wise! For what are intuitions but the soul's blind reachings after its supremest goals? Divining helps whereby it may essay a stronger sweep along its upward way, seeking in glad yet reverential mood all gentle friendships and the wise and the good of every nation age and look around shall not such helps such friendships here be found o sages poets who shall fill this place with lavish store of wisdom sweetness grace here we may pay our homage and grow wise and glad beneath your helpful ministries here we may offer the allegiance meet to blind old homer sit at milton's feet and learn of both as fails the outward sight to trim anew the spirit's inner light may sing with chaucer walk in fairyland with sweet-lipped spencer taking dante's hand explore the dark abyss where denied all hope of exit hapless souls abide may summon shakespeare in himself a host king lear and sweet ophelia hamlet's ghost sad desdemona egypt's peerless queen coming and going on the shifting scene continue with cowper walk afield with burns and listen to him as he sings by turns of luckless tam o'shanter and his mare sweet highland mary and the brig's a air or coming down to later times rehearse with tennyson his grand immortal verse talk with dogmatic scholarly carlyle uncouth but grimly honest all the while abide with our own emerson or go a-wooing after nature with thoreau though for that matter all the poets woo the gentle nymph and our immortal few are whittier and longfellow and holmes bryant and low whosoever roams with either sees fair nature with new eyes and life with larger possibilities end of poem this recording is in the public domain. To a Little Invisible Being Who is Expected Soon to Become Visible By Anna Letitia Barbold Read for LibriVox.org by Gemma Germ of new life, whose powers expanding slow For many a moon their full perfection wait. Haste! precious pledge of happy love to go auspicious born through life's mysterious gate what powers lie folded in thy curious frame senses from objects locked and mind from thought how little canst thou guess thy lofty claim to grasp at all the worlds the almighty wrought and see the genial season's warmth to share Fresh younglings shoot, and opening roses glow. Swarms of new life exulting fill the air. Haste, infant bud of being, haste to blow. 
For thee the nurse prepares her lulling songs, The eager matrons count the lingering day, But far the most thy anxious parent longs, On thy soft cheek a mother's kiss to lay, She only asks to lay her burden down, That her glad arms that burden may resume, and nature's sharpest pangs her wishes crown, That free thee living from thy living tomb. She longs to fold to her maternal breast Part of herself, yet to herself unknown, To see and to salute the stranger guest, Fed with her life through many a tedious moon. Come, reap thy rich inheritance of love, Bask in the fondness of a mother's eye, Nor wit nor eloquence her heart shall move Like the first accents of thy feeble cry. Haste, little captive, burst thy prison doors, Launch on the living world and spring to light. Nature for thee displays her various stores, Opens her thousand inlets of delight. If charmed verse or muttered prayers had power, with favouring spells to speed thee on thy way, Anxious I'd bid my beads each passing hour, Till thy wished smile thy mother's pangs or pay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lovers by C. J. Dennis Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles the lovers one idle hour she sought to see whose image twas he cherished so all fondly certain whose twould be and found a girl she did not know a trusting maiden's modest face all innocence and purity what nun is this that fills my place alas he loves me not sighed she nay daughter let no foolish fears your trust in his devotion ma her mother said come dry your tears that is the girl he thinks you are all fondly curious with love half guessing what he would lay bare he rifled her heart's treasure trove and found a stranger's image there this is the man she loves said he and searching in the noble face read high resolve and constancy this saint he cried usurps my place nay spoke his friend your anger cool gaze on that godlike face once more and then be satisfied o oh fool that is the man she takes you for end of poem this recording is in the public domain An Old Master by C. J. Dennis Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug We were cartin' lathes and palins From the slopes of Mount St. Leonard With our axles near the roadbed And the mud as stiff as glue And our bullocks weren't precisely What you'd call conditioned nicely And meself and messmate Mitchell Had our doubts of getting through it had rained a tidy skyfall in the week before we started, but our tucker bag depended on the sellum of our load. So we punched em on by inches, lifting em across the pinches, till we struck the final section of the worst part of the road. We were just congratulating one another on the going when we blundered in a pothole right within the sight of goal, where the bush track joins the metal. Mitchell, as he saw her settle, justified his reputation at the peril of his soul. We were in a glue pot certain, red and stiff and most tenacious, over knaves and over axles, wagons sitting on the road. Struth, says I, they'll never lift her, take a shot from hell to shift her, nothing left us but unyoke em and sling off the blessed load. Now, beside our scene of trouble, stood a little one-roomed humpy, home of an enfeebled party by the name of Dad McGee. 
Daddy was, I pause to mention, living on an old age pension since he gave up bullock punchin' at the age of eighty-three. Startled by our exclamations, Daddy hobbled from the shanty, gazing where the stranded wagon looked like some half-founded ship. When the state of things he spotted, Look, he says, like you was potted, and he toddles up to Mitchell. Here, yeah, says he, give me that whip. Well, I've heard of transformations, heard of fellas sort of changing in the face of sudden danger or some great emergency, heard the like in song and story and in bush traditions hoary, but I nearly dropped me bundle as I looked at Dad McGee. While we gazed, he seemed to toughen. As his fingers gripped the handle, his old form grew straight and supple, and a light leapt in his eye. And he stepped around the wagon, not with footsteps weak and lagging, but with firm, determined bearing, as he flung the whip on high. Now he swung the leaders over, while the whiplash snarled and volleyed, and they answered like one bully, straining to each crack and clout but he kept his cursin' under till old Brindle made a blunder. Then I thought all hell had hit me, and the master opened out. And the language, oh, the language, seemed to me I must be dreamin', while the wondrous words and phrases only genius could produce roared and rumbled fast and faster in the throat of that old master, oaths and curses tipped with lightning crackling flames of fierce abuse. Then we knew the man before us was a master of our calling, one of those great lords of language gone for ever from our back. Heroes of an ancient order, men who punched across the border, vanished giants of the sixties, puncher princes of the track. Now we heard the timber straining, heard the wagons loud complaining, and the master cried triumphant as he swung em into line, as they put their shoulders to it, lifted her and pulled her through it. That's the way we used to do it in the days of sixty-nine. Near the foot of Mount St. Leonard lives an old enfeebled party who retired from bullock punchin' at the age of eighty-three. If you seek him, folk will mention merely that he draws the pension, but to us he looms a master prince of punches, Dad McGee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our Limitations by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. We trust and fear, we question and believe. From life's dark threads, a trembling faith to weave. Frail as the web that misty night has spun, Whose dew-gemmed awnings glitter in the sun. While the calm centuries spell their lessons out, Each truth we conquer spreads the realm of doubt. When Sinai's summit was Jehovah's throne, The chosen prophet knew his voice alone. When Pilate's hall that awful question heard, The heavenly captive answered not a word. Eternal truth, beyond our hopes and fears, Sweep the vast orbits of thy myriad spheres. From age to age, while history carves sublime, On her waste rock the flaming curves of time. How the wild swayings of our planet show That worlds unseen surround the world we know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pantheist's Song of Immortality by Constance Naden Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Bring snow-white lilies, pallid, heart-flushed roses, and wreathe her brow with heavy-scented flowers. In soft, undreaming sleep her head reposes, while unregretted pass the sunlit hours. Few sorrows did she know, and all are over. A thousand joys, but they are all forgot. 
her life was one fair dream of friend and lover and they were false ah well she knows it not look in her face and lose thy dread of dying weep not that rest will come that toil will cease is it not well to lie as she is lying in utter silence and in perfect peace canst thou repine that sentient days are numbered death is unconscious life that waits for birth so didst thou live while yet thine embryo slumbered senseless unbreathing even as heaven and earth then shrink no more from death though life be gladness nor seek him restless in thy lonely pain the law of joy ordains each hour of sadness and firm or frail thou canst not live in vain what though thy name by no sad lips be spoken and no fond heart shall keep thy memory green thou yet shalt leave thine own enduring token for earth is not as though thou ne'er hadst been see yon broad current hasting to the ocean its ripples glorious in the western red each wavelet passes trackless yet its motion has changed for evermore the river-bed ah wherefore weep although the form and fashion of what thou seemest fades like sunset flame the uncreated source of toil and passion through everlasting change abides the same yes thou shalt die but these almighty forces that meet to form thee live for evermore they hold the suns in their eternal courses and shape the tiny sand grains on the shore be calmly glad thine own true kindred seeing in fire and storm in flowers with dew impearled rejoice in thine imperishable being one with the essence of the boundless world end of poem this recording is in the public domain Questions and Answers by Oliver Wendell Holmes Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Where, oh where, are the visions of morning, Fresh as the dews of our prime, Gone, like tenants that quit without warning, Down the back entry of time? Where, oh where, are life's lilies and roses, nursed in the golden dawn's smile dead as the bulrushes round little moses on the old banks of the nile where are the marys and annes and elizas loving and lovely of yore look in the columns of old advertisers married and dead by the score where the gray colts and the ten-year-old fillies saturday's triumph and joy gone like our friend greek achilles homer's ferocious old boy die away dreams of ecstatic emotion hopes like young eagles at play vows of unheard of and endless devotion how ye have faded away yet through the ebbing of time's mighty river leave our young blossoms to die let him roll smooth in his current forever till the last pebble is dry end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sadness of the moon by charles baudelaire Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Pyle. The moon more indolently dreams tonight than a fair woman on her couch at rest, caressing, with a hand distraught and light, before she sleeps the contour of her breast. Upon her silken avalanche of down, dying, she breathes a long and swooning sigh, and watches the white visions past her flown, which rise like blossoms to the azure sky. And when, at times, wrapped in her languor deep, Earthward she lets a furtive teardrop flow, Some pious poet, enemy of sleep, Takes in his hollow hand the tear of snow, Whence gleams of iris and opal start, And hides it from the sun deep in his heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Sledge at the Gate by Richard Henry Stoddard Read for LibriVox.org by Raymond Cockle Lapland I would run this arrow straight into my heart Sooner than see what I saw tonight I harnessed my reindeer, mounted the sledge And skimmed the snow by the northern light The thin ice crackled, the water roared But I crossed the fjord I reached the house when the night is late. What's this? A deer and a sledge at the gate. The eyes of Zela are winter springs, but the wealth of summer is in her hair. She loves me not, she's false again. Or why are the sledge and the reindeer there? I throw myself down face first in the snow. Let the false one go. She never shall know my love or my scorn. For I shall be frozen stiff in the morn. The sharp winds blew, and my limbs grew chill. I knew no more till I felt the fire. They rubbed to my breast, and they rubbed to my hands, And my life came back like a dark desire. She spake kind words and smoothed my hair, But the sledge was there. Ah, false but fair! It was all I said. I struck her down, and away I fled. I mounted my sledge, and the reindeer flew, In the wind, in the snow, in the blinding sleet. The wolves were hungry, they scented my track, But I fought them back. I fear neither wolves nor the winter's cold, For the faithless woman has made me bold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song of a Second April by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira Searle April 2015 April this year, not otherwise than April of a year ago, Is full of whispers, full of sighs, of dazzling mud, and dingy snow hepaticas that pleased you so are here again and butterflies their rings are hammering all day and shingles lie about the doors in orchards near and far away the grey woodpecker taps and bores and men are merry at their chores and children earnest at their play. The larger streams run still and deep, Noisy and swift the small brooks run. Among the mullen stalks the sheep Go up the hillside in the sun, Pensively. Only you are gone, You that alone I cared to keep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 97 by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year! What freezings have I felt, what dark days seen, What old December's bareness everywhere! And yet this time removed was summer's time, The teeming autumn big with rich increase, Bearing the wanton burden of the prime, Like widowed wombs after their lord's decease. Yet this abundant issue seemed to me But hope of orphans and unfathered fruit, for summer and his pleasures wait on thee, And thou away, the very birds are mute, Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer That leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Unattainable by Lawrence Hope Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist 
oh that my blood were water thou athirst and thou and i in some far desert land how would i shed it gladly if but first it touched thy lips before it reached the sand once ah the gods were good to me i threw myself upon a poisoned snake that crept where my beloved a lesser love we knew than this which now consumes me wholly slept but thou alas what can i do for thee by fate and thine own beauty set above the need of all or any aid from me too high for service as too far for love end of poem this recording is in the public domain when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed by walt whitman read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night i mourned and yet shall mourn with ever returning spring o ever returning spring trinity sure to me you bring lilac blooming perennial and drooping star in the west and thought of him i love o powerful western fallen star o shades of night o moody tearful night o great star disappeared o the black murk that hides the star o cruel hands that hold me powerless o helpless soul of me o harsh surrounding cloud that will not free my soul in the dooryard fronting an old farmhouse near the whitewashed palings stands the lilac bush tall growing with heart-shaped leaves of rich green with many a pointed blossom rising delicate with a perfume strong i love with every leaf a miracle and from this bush in the dooryard with delicate colored blossoms and heart-shaped leaves of rich green a sprig with its flower i break in the swamp in secluded recesses a shy and hidden bird is warbling a song solitary the thrush the hermit withdrawn to himself avoiding the settlements sings by himself a song song of the bleeding throat death's outlet song of life for well dear brother i know if thou wast not gifted to sing thou wouldst surely die over the breast of the spring the land amid cities amid lanes and through old woods where lately the violets peeped from the ground spotting the gray debris amid the grass in the fields each side of the lanes passing the endless grass passing the yellow speared wheat every grain from its shroud in the dark brown fields uprising passing the apple tree blows of white and pink in the orchards carrying a corpse to where it shall rest in the grave night and day journeys a coffin coffin that passes through lanes and streets through day and night with a great cloud darkening the land with the pomp of the enlooped flags with the cities draped in black with the show of the states themselves as of crape veiled women standing with processions long and winding and the flambeaux of the night with the countless torches lit with the silent sea of faces and the unbared heads with the waiting depot the arriving coffin and the sombre faces with dirges through the night with a thousand voices rising strong and solemn with all the mournful voices of the dirges poured around the coffin the dim lit churches and the shuddering organs where amid these you journey with a tolling tolling bells perpetual clang here coffin that slowly passes i give you my sprig of lilac nor for you for one alone blossoms and branches green to coffins all i bring for fresh is the morning thus would i carol a song for you o sane and sacred death all over bouquets of roses o death i cover you over with roses and early lilies but mostly and now the lilac that blooms the first copious i break I break the sprigs from the bushes, 
With loaded arms I come pouring for you, for you, and the coffins all of you, O death. O western orb sailing the heaven, now I know what you must have meant, as a month since we walked, as we walked up and down in the dark blue so mystic, as we walked in silence the transparent shadowy night, as I saw you had something to tell, as you bent to me night after night, as you drooped from the sky low down as if to my side, while the other stars all looked on as we wandered together the solemn night for something i know not what kept me from sleep as the night advanced and i saw on the rim of the west ere you went how full you were of woe as i stood on the rising ground in the breeze in the cold transparent night as i watched where you passed and was lost in the netherward black of the night as my soul in its trouble dissatisfied sank as where you, sad orb, concluded, dropped in the night, and was gone. Sing on there in the swamp. O oh, singer, bashful and tender, I hear your notes, I hear your call. I hear, I come presently, I understand you. But a moment I linger, for the lustrous star has detained me. The star, my departing comrade, holds and detains me. Oh, how shall I warble myself for the dead one there I loved? And how shall I deck my song for the large, sweet soul that has gone? And what shall my perfume be for the grave of him I love? Sea winds blown from east and west, blown from the eastern sea and blown from the western sea, until there on the prairies meeting these and with these and the breath of my chant, I perfume the grave of him I love. Oh, what shall I hang on the chamber walls? And what shall the pictures be that I hang on the walls to adorn the burial house of him I love? Pictures of growing spring and farms and homes with the fourth month eve at sundown and the gray smoke lucid and bright with floods of the yellow gold of the gorgeous indolent sinking sun burning expanding the air with the fresh sweet herbage underfoot and the pale green leaves of the trees prolific in the distance the flowing glaze the breast of the river with a wind dapple here and there with ranging hills on the banks with many a line against the sky and shadows and the city at hand with dwellings so dense and stacks of chimneys and all the scenes of life and the workshops and the workmen homeward returning lo body and soul this land Mighty Manhattan with spires and the sparkling and hurrying tides and the ships, the varied and ample land, the south and the north and the light, Ohio's shores and flashing Missouri, and ever the far-spreading prairies covered with grass and corn. Lo, the most excellent sun, so calm and haughty, the violet and purple morn with just felt breezes, the gentle soft-born measureless light, the miracle spreading, bathing all, the fulfilled noon, the coming eve delicious, the welcome night and the stars over my cities shining all, enveloping man and land. Sing on, sing on, you gray-brown bird. Sing from the swamps, the recesses. Pour your chant from the bushes, limitless out of the dust, out of the cedars and pines. Sing on, dearest brother, warble your reedy song, loud human song, with voice of uttermost woe. O oh, liquid and free and tender, O oh, wild and loose to my soul, O oh, wondrous singer, you only I hear, yet the star holds me, but will soon depart, yet the lilac with mastering odor holds me. Now, while I sit in the day and looked forth, in the close of the day, with its light and the fields of spring, and the farmer preparing his crops, in the large unconscious scenery of my land, with its lakes and forests, in the heavenly aerial beauty 
after the perturbed winds and the storms, under the arching heavens of the afternoon, swift passing, and the voices of children and women, the many moving sea tides, and I saw the ships, how they sailed, and the summer approaching with richness, and the fields all busy with labor, and the infinite separate houses, how they all went on, each with its meals and minutia of daily usages, and the streets, how their throbbings throbbed, and the cities pent, lo, then and there, falling upon them all, and among them all, enveloping me with the rest, appeared the cloud, appeared the long black trail, and I knew death, its thought, and the sacred knowledge of death. Then, with the knowledge of death as walking one side of me, and the thought of death close walking the other side of me, and I in the middle, as with companions, and as holding the hands of companions, I fled forth to the hiding, receiving night that talks not, down to the shores of the water, the path by the swamp in the dimness, to the solemn shadowy cedars and ghostly pines so still, and the singer, so shy to the rest, received me. The gray-brown bird, I know, received us comrades three, and he sang what seemed the carol of death, and a verse for him I love. From deep secluded recesses, from the fragrant cedars and the ghostly pines so still, came the carol of the bird, and the charm of the carol wrapped me, as I held, as if by their hands, my comrades in the night, and the voice of my spirit tallied the song of the bird. Death Carol Come, lovely and soothing death, undulate round the world, serenely arriving, arriving in the day, in the night, to all, to each, sooner or later, delicate death. Praised be the fathomless universe for life and joy, and for objects and knowledge curious, and for love, sweet love, but praise, praise, praise for the sure and winding arms of cool enfolding death. Dark mother, always gliding near with soft feet, have none chanted for thee a chant of fullest welcome? Then I chant it for thee, I glorify thee above all. I bring thee a song that when thou must indeed come, come unfalteringly. Approach, strong, deliver us. When it is so, when thou hast taken them, I joyously sing the dead, lost in the loving floating ocean of thee, laved in the flood of thy bliss, O death from me to thee glad serenades dances for thee i propose saluting thee adornments and feastings for thee and in the sights of the open landscape and the high spread sky are fitting and life and the fields and the huge and thoughtful night the night in silence under many a star the ocean shore and the husky whispering wave whose voice i know and the soul turning to thee o vast and well-veiled death and the body gratefully nestling close to thee over the tree-tops i float thee a song over the rising and sinking waves over the myriad fields and the prairies wide over the dense packed cities all and the teeming wharfs and ways i float this carol with joy with joy to thee o death to the tally of my soul, loud and strong, kept up the gray-brown bird, with pure, deliberate notes spreading, filling the night. Loud in the pines and cedars dim, clear in the freshness moist and the swamp perfume, and I with my comrades there in the night. Why, my sight that was bound in my eyes unclosed as to long panoramas of visions. I saw askant the armies, and i saw as in noiseless dreams hundreds of battle flags borne through the smoke of the battles and pierced with missiles i saw them and carried hither and yon through the smoke and torn and bloody and at last but a few shreds left on the staffs and all in silence 
and the staffs all splintered and broken. I saw battle corpses, myriads of them, and the white skeletons of young men, I saw them. I saw the debris and debris of all the dead soldiers of the war, but I saw they were not as was thought. They themselves were fully at rest, they suffered not. The living remained and suffered. The mother suffered, and the wife and the child and the musing comrade suffered, and the armies that remained suffered. Passing the visions, passing the night, passing unloosing the hold of my comrades' hands, passing the song of the hermit bird and the tallying song of my soul, victorious song, death's outlet song, yet varying, ever altering song, as low and wailing, yet clear the notes rising and falling, flooding the night, sadly sinking and fainting, as warning and warning, and yet again bursting with joy, covering the earth and filling the spread of the heaven, as that powerful psalm in the night I heard from recesses. Passing, I leave thee, lilac with heart-shaped leaves i leave thee there in the dooryard blooming returning with spring i cease from my song for thee from my gaze on thee in the west fronting the west communing with thee o comrade lustrous with silver face in the night yet each i keep and all retrievements out of the night the song the wondrous chant of the gray-brown bird, and the tallying chant, the echo aroused in my soul. With a lustrous and drooping star, with a countenance full of woe, with a lilac tall and its blossoms of mastering odor, with the holders holding my hand, nearing the call of the bird, comrades mine, and I in the midst, and their memory ever I keep, for the dead I loved so well. For the sweetest, wisest soul of all my days and lands, And this for his dear sake, Lilac and star and bird, Twined with the chant of my soul, There in the fragrant pines, And the cedars dusk and dim. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Written in Early Spring by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King I heard a thousand blended notes While in a grove I sat reclined In that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts Bring sad thoughts to the mind To her fair works did nature link The human soul that through me ran And much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man. Through primrose tufts, in that sweet bower, The periwinkle trailed its wreaths, And tis my faith that every flower Enjoys the air it breathes. The birds around me hopped and played, Their thoughts I cannot measure, But the least motion which they made, It seemed a thrill of pleasure. The budding twigs spread out their fan, to catch the breezy air, and I must think, do all I can, that there was pleasure there. If this belief from heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.